just a bit of a context of, of why tonight, um, because it's the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, um, and what does that mean? And it's really interesting, there was, hey, uh, there was such, um, such a hunger for tonight, because we, we framed it purposely from queer tools of London and entity deportations and lesbian and gay support the migrants as a question. Like, where do our rebellions lie now? Um, because I think we're all here because we know the struggle isn't over. Um, so we've got incredible panellists who are just going to say their, their opinion on what we need to do to celebrate how far we've come and agitate for more. So we've got Aya, we've got, um, we've got um, Kate um, from Campaign Against the Arms Trade and Lesbian and Gay Support the Migrants. We've got Lindsay, this is a panel, we've got Lindsay from um, Lesbian and Gay Support the Migrants, Plain Stupid, and he's one of the Stansard 15 defendants whose sentencing is this week. Who the profit from tonight goes to? We've got our Teddy here from the Gay Liberation Front, who's been active in the Gay Liberation Front since 1974? 75. 75. Because um, we could go more into context, but the Gay Liberation Front UK was started when two activists who used to meet at the London School of Economics went to America and met the Gay Liberation Front activists there who were formed out of the Stonewall riots and particularly out of the Black Power convention there. Of course we never hear about any of this in Pride in London Corporation now, uh, but we're really trying to pay tribute and celebrate the radical intersectional roots of Pride. There's not that many good films about Stonewall that I've found. There was a whole controversy between the conflict between Happy Birthday Marsha and the death and life of Marsha P. Johnson, uh, which we can talk about. Um, hey, uh, welcome. Um, oh, okay, cool. Um, so, before and after Stonewall, the making of a gay and lesbian community. On, the June, on June the 28th, 1969, uh, the New York Police Department raided the Stonewall Inn, a mafia-run gay bar in New York's Greenwich Village, leading to three nights of rioting by the city's gay community. With this outpouring of courage and unity, the gay pride movement had begun. These two seminal documentaries tell the remarkable tale of how homosexuals a heretofore hidden and despised group became a vibrant and integral part of America's family and indeed the world community. The bar patrons who rioted in British Village after a routine police raid on a gay bar, the Stonewall Inn, in June of 1969, could not have known that their wild insurrection would enter history as the birthday of the gay liberation movement. Gay is proud! Today, the lesbian and gay community is a highly visible aspect of American society. Gay is love! How did this come about? By focusing on the unconventional behavior and the often lonely rebellion of those homosexuals who lived before Stonewall, we can begin to understand how the gay community evolved. Before we hear from our speakers about the question of where do our rebellions lie now, can we just have a few insights about uh, thoughts or favourite parts or new things that you learned from the film itself? Or what you thought was missing or what made you angry? Any insights about the film at all? I, I felt that, that I keep hearing um, the same themes, only it's very different language used to describe it now than it would have been then. Mm. So I think that maybe language is a bit of a barrier amongst cultures between ages. Mm -mm. Um, like, I didn't know what pronoun meant until about a year or so ago. That was rubbish in English grammar. I didn't know what a pronoun was. So, you know, I'm not used to using that kind of language, so. Yeah, language is very different, yeah. It's really interesting you say that because for me, like hearing people from an older generation, like in that film talking, there was so many experiences they had that I could remember in my own life. Like mm -hmm. one of them was talking about the first time she was in a room with lesbians and I was like, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and, we <thought> <laughs> and like just reading like a part of literature or watch, seeing something and it's like, oh my God, that's me. And I, I love the fact thousands of people on the street. It's just such a shock. Yeah. Having never seen more than like a, a room full of people at one time to suddenly see thousands on the street. Oh my God. Something I found interesting was when they were talking about when the woman was talking about her experiences of being forced out of employment for being queer and having been forced to name other queer people. And it reminded me and reminds me of 
what's happening in Chechnya at the moment and a lot of men and queer people in general who are detained are then tortured and forced to expose other queer people and the kind of intimidation tactics there really resonated with the situation in Chechnya. Mm -hmm. It isn't that long since that happened here. I had an ex-girlfriend who was drilled out of the military in the mm. 70s and was forced to name lovers yeah. in the 70s, mm. but not that long ago. Yeah. And we're talking about people being forced to name lovers, like people going through the deportation, mm. or being threatened with the deportation process. They'll go to their home office interview and say, I'm being persecuted because I'm a lesbian, it's being safe to be a lesbian in Nigeria. And the home office, person would be like, well, prove it. Like, where are your sex tapes? Mm -hmm. Where are your, like, who, you're just making this up, these are just your friends. Like, like one of my young, Dan's pals, Adorake Pata, she was yeah. fighting, uh, fighting for her right to have asylum for 13 years. Mm -hmm. <gasps> you know, you think a home office person would have the, like, ability to think, oh, maybe, maybe they're like, maybe they're not making this up. <laughs> but she still has to prove, like, prove it. I saw something the other day that was a woman who was seeking asylum for her sexuality. Bearing in mind 78% of applications for asylum based on sexuality were rejected last year, which is 50% increase in rejection. But she got told that um, her being in contact with her children wasn't displaying lesbian behaviour and her <laughs> asylum claim got rejected. But there's also like not a lot of protection legally and internationally which binds nation states to have to like adhere to certain policies. Mm -hmm. So for example, the same thing with the UK and the US, they don't actually have to, they have their own practices of how they determine the person's gender identity, which isn't necessarily based on how that person decides to express their gender identity. So for example, when seeking for asylum as a trans woman in the United States or in the UK, it's up to the eye of the beholder to determine your gender identity. It's not, and like the United Nations, UNHCR, they have this organized, like this practice for the industry, and that's basically bringing women to the forefront of any sort of like experiences with displacement. But in their definition of women, they don't include trans women, it's mm -hmm. just cis women. Trans women included in the LGB spectrum. So we obviously conflate gender identity and sexual orientation in these problematic ways, but when we don't have legally binding charters, which force nation states to understand the intricacies and the differences. That's, you know, when asylum claims don't get accepted. Mm. Definitely, I think also, but recently some of my friends from Bangladesh uh, were seeking asylum here and they were expected to kind of articulate and prove their kind of history of being queer, but they lived in a place where their life was in danger if they were articulating that queerness. So how are they supposed to have this kind of articulation when they've never lived in a, in a place where they're allowed to talk about it in a second language. Mm. It's crazy. What are those all inside? That side of the room? I mean, um, I don't know, it's, talk about immigration is a really difficult thing for me because my family migrated to the UK when I was 13, so yeah. I, I watched them kind of go through that process and have their um, how, like being rejected by home office and how like scary it was and how lucky I am that I didn't have to deal with it and I can't imagine what it would be like me having to done that like now that I know I'm queer mm. and I, I don't know I mean, it's like I don't even know why we're expecting so much from the home office like, they, don't want <laughs> they don't want people to come yeah. here they don't want people of colour to move here so it's not that they don't understand homosexuality. Mm. It's just that that's just one more thing for them to use against people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think the problem is like teaching the home office what being gay is all about. It's just teaching them not to be racist. Like yeah. that's yeah. that's yeah. kind of the issue. It's not the fact, the fact that they think, oh yeah, be a, what 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 does a lesbian look like? It's just that's, it's just something they're using against people. Um, my dad had to tell an immigration officer everything he knew about the Bible. <laughs> wow. You know, and um, I remember um, the guy asked him a question in the interview and he didn't know the answer and then he asked the guy, do you know the answer? And he was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was because, you know, my family were Christians and they, they couldn't live in Iran anymore. And, you know, it's it just kind of funny how hard they have to work to like prove your life is at risk. It's mm -hmm. also having to prove it based on a certain modality of existence. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, you know, not every lesbian looks the same, not every queer person looks the same. We enforce these like westernized perspectives of what sexuality is or gender identity is or what it is to be non-heterosexual. And the problem is that, you know, it links into this idea with pronouns, what you were saying before. You know, in my language in Turkish, we don't have pronouns because we don't have gender. It's the same in Farsi. Yeah, exactly. There's no gender. Everything is just the same. It's all, it's one letter. Mm. But obviously these conversations, these discourses about pronouns and about identity, about sexuality, we don't realize that we do kind of perpetuate like a very westernized practice of how we determine what sexuality or gender identity is. And I think one of the important things is to like decondition and decolonize the like concepts and the knowledge which we have surrounding sexuality and gender identity before we can take any kind of steps forward. Mm. So, you know, that's a practice which we will have to kind of instill, I think. Mm. Well, the most absurd example of that story is um, in French, genderizing objects. Yeah. So when I teach, I have a tutor, um, it's an obsession. And when I try and get in this idea of like your genderized pronouns and why we're so obsessed with it, including in our language someone's gender mm. as the only sort of important bit of information in a pronoun. You know, if you think in terms of like in French, you have like, or Italian or in Spanish, you have like a book can be a boy or like a you know, banana can be a girl. Yeah. yeah, we have the same in Arabic as well, which is, is quite frustrating. But in Berlin, like I helped to run this thing, uh, which was part of Turkish Berlin in Brandenburg, which is an organization which focuses on Turkish migrants, Turkish speaking migrants in Berlin. And one of like the most productive things which they did, and I helped them do as an organization, is talking to the parents and family members of queer people and teaching them and interacting with them and helping them to understand language which may be seen as foreign and alien. Like for me, when I came out, so to speak, to my family, I had to make sure that I used language which wasn't heavily charged with a very westernized perception of what it is to be LGBT. You know, if I had just come out and said to my dad, for example, I'm gay, he would have had this massive idea of what it is to be gay based on what his reaction is from his inexperience or his ignorance or the, the cultural dissimilarity, so to speak. So I think, you know, conversations need to be very interactive, they need to be very intersectional, but that decoloniality is like the fundamental aspect of things and like understanding that like terminologies go so far in how people can communicate and like recognizing the gendered implications of languages we use, how when we talk about pronouns that there are certain languages which don't use pronouns because they don't have gender, keeping those all in the discussion yeah. is how you have like a coalitional, productive and like progressive conversation. Yeah, I also think like remembering how responsible the British Empire is for the homophobia that exists in certain societies and that was actually instilled by imperial presence, for example, in India. I mean, that was basically the result of like a colonised presence enforcing homophobic laws. I mean, India has like a long and rich history of, of kind of queer communities and that was kind of an attempt by the British government to, to kind of stamp that out. So to suggest, that, to then look at these places and be like, oh, ridiculous that you know you can't be queer there. I mean, that's all do it in part. I think something that I find really frustrating is like the lack of knowledge within our own community around these issues. I used that conversation to break up with one of my boyfriends who was um, queer and trans <laughs> because, um, you know, there's this idea that like people of colour are more homophobic or more transphobic and I had this ex who, I keep talking about him, it's really bad, <laughs> <laughs> but he literally believed that people of colour and like Muslim um, people were like looking at him worse than like white people looked at him for being trans mm. and that was really problematic and you know I, I said that whole thing of like oh it's your fault <laughs> and you know it, it is really heartbreaking because like it's, it's, it's just that idea of being gay has a certain look mm. and the language around it is really difficult because even in this film like people who had like English as a native language, they even struggled to talk about it. You know, when I came out to my mom, I didn't know what to say. Mm. So I just said I didn't like men. And then she was like, you're not missing out. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, it's, it's really funny, but also I just didn't know what else to say because all the words that we have that in, in Farsi that are like, you know, that mean like gay, homosexual, it's just like so charged with like a negative idea. 
And I think, I don't know, I just wish like white people in our community were more like considerate and understanding of like how much of a like, bigger step some of us have to take. Um, yeah, mm. I think, and we'll come to probably talk about this later, but a big reason <coughs> that lesbians and gays support the migrants were set up was because the media and general narratives were starting to position queer people in opposition to Muslim people, in opposition to migrants, and justifying Islamophobia as somehow defending queer rights. I mean, there's a group run by the English Defence League called Gays Against Sharia. I mean, the fact that the English Defence League are pretending to give a shit about queer people is mad, but like, <laughs> the yeah. it's just a front to be Islamophobic and xenophobic and to perpetuate hate crimes, essentially, yeah. under the guise of pretending to care about LGBTQ people, which they've never cared about before. Um, there are people who define themselves as LGBT but also part of that. Like, Dan and I were chased in 2000. No, you're getting the news, right? So we were chased and like attacked by members of UK who were walking in pride, and like, we were all like dressed up, and obviously. A, a big amount of us were people of colour and we were kind of standing there like okay this is really fucked up it's not like you can really turn to rely on the police either because mm. we're just going to be equally brutalised so mm. you know I think it does take away from the agency that some people do have in that sense that they are willingly like there are members of our community who are like flat out racist they are not brutalising just this thing which they're not part of to be racist or Islamophobic they are members of our community who still embody that and I think that like you know, those are those are like the sneaky little people who kind of like, you know, and it doesn't always have to be macroaggressive, it can also be very microaggressive. Like, conversations I have, if I go to Dawson Superstore, I don't enter that place because the last time I went there, it's the same thing over and over again. Where are you from? Where are you really from? All those conversations. Do your parents know you're gay? Like, the moment I tell people I'm Syrian and I'm Turkish, like, those charged things come out, and it's just, you know, they come in different forms, but they're everywhere, and it's not just the EDL. Yeah, it's not. It's in our own um, families often as well. Like, with, I really like the topic of coming out stories coming up because just the uh, like learning about people's reactions. Like, you know, lots of people have these like, oh, it's fine, you know, gay rights. They've been one. It's all fine now. It's all fine. It's like it's those those we've just been talking about ideas of like what a gay person looks like, what a lesbian person looks like, what a queer person looks like. I was on Brighton Beach with my dad when I decided to tell him and like like you were saying you were pissed off for words, like I was like, well, how do I say this? And I was kinda like, wow. And I said the word queer and he was like, Oh you can't say that, that's, that's a mean word. And I was like, I don't know, I was like, oh, fuck, I've got to explain what reclaiming is now. <laughs> and it's you know no. Yeah, it's just it's just too much and then like now I have a boyfriend, he's like, Oh you chosen now. You've chosen now. And I'm like, oh no, was it just a I really like respect everything you said, but I also know that like my dad, you know, he's working class, he would if he liked you mm -hmm. go and he'd panic hearing someone so <coughs> much and so intelligent as you saying all that, he'd go inside that mode of I don't know anything about this or I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm less because you know this is someone who was kicked out of grammar school because he wasn't smart enough. And and I found the amount of, like we all do so much work right to just exist in the world, that's who we are, to just be ourselves, like the amount of extra steps that have to be taken as a queer person to be like, oh yeah, this is me, this is not just some idea of who I am, this is not just what I'm told to be, this is not a straight idea of who I am, this is, this is actually me. And then to go a step further and think I have to communicate this to someone, even when they're like, I don't understand you, who are you, categorise yourself for me. And the amount of effort it takes to have those compassionate conversations, because I could definitely like come at my dad with all those books that I've read. And he just he just like he'd freak out. So something I'm really interested in also from like I do lots of youth work and I've set up projects where I I've trained role models to have really difficult conversations and like give listening space for young people to say and explore who am I, like what's going on in my life and have those those spaces, which we like I was in school and it was section twenty eight. Um, but the thing I'm really interested in. Explain what Section 28 for people. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, Section 28, so I was uh, born and raised in Yorkshire, but in England, and Section 28 was in force across the UK, which was, was it, who, which Prime Minister was it? Thatcher. 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 Thatc
the, the law saying you cannot promote homosexuality in schools. Um, and it was it was eventually like out, outlawed and that is the anniversary this year, but the the le a legacy of that is when I went to secondary schools to to set, say we're running this project, we're gonna be talking about queerness and, and like you know sexual relationships and mental health and everything else that young people want to talk about. Some of the teachers still today were like, Can we talk about that? Mm. And I was like, mm. Yeah. <laughs> and like, <"I'm> sure. <laughs> they were scared they were gonna get criminalised. And it comes and I, I'm having a long spiel, so I'll wrap up. But the the one of the most precious things that Dan has actually taught me is this principle of meeting people where they're at. And I felt extreme fury. Like I want to. Like today's actually been a day when I like want to punch multiple holes in all the walls in people's faces because of like how the world is sometimes. And I've seen a lot of nods. Yeah, we feel like that a lot, right? Um, all different kinds of reasons. But if you have, if you look after yourself to some, for however way you can meet someone where they're at, like I can have that awkward conversation with my dad where I'm like, yeah, and I smile and I, I like, you know, you, you give yourself that space to be a bit more yourself. And then if you've got that, you can give that to someone else. So that's, that's like the thing I'm most interested in. I'm really sorry I missed the film. But I'm interested in how can this be, <laughs> this be, this be used to start these conversations where people can like be more themselves mm. with other people mm -hmm. and not just yeah not just like this is this is how it is mm. like how can we get to where we need to be i think that's been done like quite it's there is some progression when you like I, I kind of speak on behalf of like my experiences in Berlin and London and comparing them and like London for example has this emerging nightlife or this emergent nightlife which has always been around which has been more like solidified this year with like Pussy Palace and PDA and even Resistance and these places where you know queer people of colour, queer people feel safe and feel comfortable to live out their modalities of existence without having to have any sort of tense or awkward interactions because you know I don't always want to explain myself and I also have that same interaction when I speak to my family I use certain terminology which I've learned in my degrees so obviously when I'm sitting there and I'm saying all this spiel it's a blank face looking back at me like yes how are you okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's nice to be in that environment but I guess you know when you compare that to like Berlin for example I did my research there on like accessibility of queer spaces for migrants of colour and it was like the most damaging and like frustrating three months, four months of like research which I did because places which are glorified like Berkheim and Butters, like about black, all these spaces which people literally travel to Berlin to go to and take photos in front of like <laughs> all of that, like these aren't queer spaces, they're like cis-centric gay spaces dominated by gay white men which use the guise of like, you know, queerness to, to kind of like, to capitalise on us essentially. And to monetize it. Yeah, exactly, to they commercialise us and it's, it's really unfortunate but I think London definitely has like a better social, like queer architecture than like other cities around the world, maybe, well, in the English-speaking world or like the Western world, I guess. Other places I know, like that Beirut, where I was in Beirut, that is like an incredible place, and Istanbul as well, which is destroyed now, unfortunately. But yeah, that needs to be what we focus on, spaces, maintaining them. Yeah, I found quite heartbroken. I started hanging out more in London a few years ago, and like, you definitely wanted them. You'd yeah. be like, oh, this used to be here, this used to be here. I'd be like, oh, I well, miss it. Yeah. <laughs> like what like especially from like the older members of our, our community who are here, like what used to exist compared to what is now? Well <laughs> what were your favourites? Well, I would like to say it's probably the oldest person in the room. 75 for each for their prize So if you if you believe in um, the rise of a, an openly equal non-prejudicial community, they tend to happen, and I'm not believing, I'm not uh, reinforcing this or whatever, but it, it's actually Western, highly developed capitalist countries, which is actually seeing the doors opening up to us being, uh, being a commodity. And the fair that you got away from that centre in terms of going to other 
countries, other nations which are being developed and whatever. Things change and, and they change and, and it's not in isolation they change. Uh, the notion of globalization doesn't happen on its own by itself somewhere in America, Washington or Britain or whatever. And that all, that's all reflected in, in, in the politics and the, the social infrastructure in our communities. And I would say that uh, a lot of the arguments that we will have today are the same arguments we had 45, 50 years ago. They haven't changed one bit. What has changed is we've been invited into the tent. We're no longer pissing into the tent. Uh, we're in the tent and some of us are still pissing out. Because what's going on in the tent is no longer what, what, what we were looking for, or fighting for, or demanding during, the, during the, the late 60s and early 70s. And that was, we wanted, and it's full of contradictions. We wanted equality, we wanted liberation and equality, right? But we didn't want to get married, that's what heterosexuals did. And of course, the minute we were able to get married, it was embraced as a step forward, which it is. When it comes to you, your taxation, the HMRC and whoever, then you're treated on an equal basis. Legally, we're treated on an equal basis. But beyond that, nothing has changed at all. And I think uh, if we're looking for today's rebellions or revolutionaries, or call it what you want, I think um, you're in good company here tonight. And I think that's because most of you actually care about what happens to your brothers and sisters wherever in the globe they are. You actually care about what's happening to the next generation that are going to come behind you. Um, I'm not a great one with language that comes to nouns, pronouns, or whatever. I could quite safely fall into, I quite unwittingly fall into using language which may not be appropriate. But I will attempt to avoid that. And I think when it comes to reaching out to other people, you have to realise that they haven't been on this boat themselves. They haven't actually been opened up to the new ideas that we, we are now actually uh, discussing and, 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 and hopefully uh, trying to have some chance of making a change. And I, I came up against it um, last week on the on the GMF side. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I put up a, a piece of uh, press with eight Turkish guys, I didn't even know they were Turkish, stating that they had attacked a group of gay people. And it had never, it never been really reported as a homophobic crime. It was, men use uh, acid against uh, some other people in, in Dolson Hackney potentially coming out of a Dolson Superstore, which they deny. They said they've been closed since 2 o'clock, this happened at 5. Mm -hmm. But everybody knows that a pub closes its doors at 2 o'clock, it doesn't say that nothing else happens beyond in there. I'm not suggesting there was. But the argument, I was accused of then of being a Tommy Robinson character by illustrating these people being homophobes because of their ethnicity. And that wasn't my argument at all. There was never ever a, a, a moment's consideration of the victims at all. None. Uh, and certainly no empathy for the victims at all. And after this long argument, I said to these, do you not consider the fact that the victims and what their ethnicity was. They actually happened to be black. Mm. But these people who were arguing, me on, arguing with me online, accusing me of being Tom C. Robert, Tom, Tom, uh, Tommy Robinson speaker like, I found them to be the racists because they were assuming that these people who were attacked were white. Mm. They were gay, but they were white. They never assumed for a minute that these young gay people could be black. And when we begin to argue and discuss and have these rows among ourselves, and they will be rows, like they were back there, handbags at dawn, storming out of meetings, whatever, that we have to consider where people are coming from when they're saying things and what other people's experiences are and their lives are like before we start throwing insults at one another. <coughs> and I think one of the things that I learned, I can scream and shout as loud as anyone else, that I learned since the 70s was that those arguments are still continuing because 
we're still being divided, we're still being separated out, we're, we're still being marginalized in many ways, only in different ways mm -hmm. and using different tools and different methods. And I think that uh, there's a meeting tonight, a GLF meeting tonight at the London School of Economics. And I'm so much happier being here mm -hmm. than being there yeah. because I have the trust of you young people here tonight mm -hmm. that are concerned enough, care enough and willing enough to continue our struggle. Sorry if I went on a bit. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much to all of our speakers because we've got 10 minutes um, before we've got to pack up. Um, and I just wanted, um, if we could all just for a few minutes speak to the person next to us about where we think the front line, because obviously as we've seen from the film and the discussions, a lot has changed and a lot hasn't about the machinery of power and how it divides us and how we divide ourselves, etc. But where do we think if there was one change, and I know there's so many changes that need to be done, but if there was one change on the front line of the queer struggle, those who are most vulnerable, because as we know, we have to start from the most oppressed and everything is connected. But I'm rambling, what is at the front line of the queer struggle at the moment we feel in Britain that we could all organise? I'll give an example. Um, we just got an email as the film was on um, because BA Pride, uh, Pride in Surrey. Pride in Surrey is the main sponsor of Pride in Surrey is BAE Systems, um, <laughs> that, which is an arms company. Oh. Um, BAE Systems have been marching at, at London Pride for years. Mm. Like they're one of the biggest um, distributors of arms in the world, mm. and it's ridiculous. But they're moving out on the Brexit. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's just an example of like the arms companies who are not our friends who are co-opting pride. For me, that's an example of the front line of queer rebellions. What is on the front line of the queer rebellion today, in Britain or wherever people are from? Yeah? Um, my perspective is very biased because I'm, I'm part of a group who's been on trial for stopping uh, deportation flight. And through that experience, I've met the women of Crossroads Women's Centre and all of the, the, the like self-help and like solid community groups that come out of there. And, the knowledge that people have in those groups, mm -hmm. like they are so strong together and they are so organized and they know exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. So that in my opinion that's that's one of the front because I like I look at when I think queer struggles, I mainly think about people in Nigerian Ghana because that's what I've been working on. And yeah, they, they know all the policies, they know all the laws, they know all the people they need to talk to, they know exactly what procedures that, you know, people in our queer community who have been threatened with deportation and their children get faced. So that's, that's the front line that I'd pick up. And yeah, if you want to get involved in Crossroads Women's Centre, always need people to help out. And also African Rainbow Family are incredible. If you've ever got, like, can do a fundraiser, they definitely need, need funds always. And, yeah, just the support. Mm, we can share all these links around on their email list if people want. Yes, please. Yeah, they're, they're such amazing movements, particularly if you move to London and want to get involved and stuff. Uh, and yeah, who's who next? Yeah. yeah. Um, we can talk to Isaac Borders and Jack Jordan if you want to share. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then we talked a bit about the LFS movement, I guess. The which one? Yeah, the LFS movement in oh, yeah. France. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how that was sort of dismissed by the other as being homophobic or racist. Mm -hmm. and the other beliefs could be better. So, well, actually, if we're part of a movement as gay people and as we've got them, you know, it, it might still be homophobic or racist in seconds, but we, we're taking a stand with that movement, even if uh, it might seem hostile at times. And I think then we found that quite interesting, as mm -hmm. quite different. 